when I first learned about you, I can't remember who said it, when they said it, it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, Dr. Ron Odrich is an elite periodontist. And when you describe yourself, you call yourself a dentist. What is the difference between a periodontist and a dentist? I know like a periodontist does some sort of surgery or does some sort of procedures that a standard dentist doesn't do. You, you don't have to talk about it a lot, but just for me, I'm curious about like all this stuff. Well, the difference is about two to four years of postgraduate training. <laughs> <laughs> it's a specialty that deals with the diseases of the gums and bone in the mouth. And it requires a lot of, uh, lot of knowledge. There's a lot of background in the anatomy of the, the oral cavity that you get automatically. And when I went to school at the Columbia, my undergraduate dental undergraduate years, um, we took our first two years with the medical students. We took all the courses of the medical students, on top of which we had to learn uh, getting started with some of the, the, the dental technical aspects, which made the first two years really daunting. But they were wonderful in that they laid down a very, um, in this school, that school in particular, a very fundamental scientific background for the time that was um, invaluable, absolutely invaluable. And then you, I went on, of course, became a dentist and got my DDS and went, uh, continued on um, for several years. I actually took me four years. Um, combined practice, general practice, and uh, learning all I could about periodontics. Periodontics has just got to do with the tissues around the teeth, aside from the teeth. It's got to do with the, the, the diseases of the gums and the bone, the effect of bone loss. And um, it's, I found it a fascinating, very interesting specialty um, that gave me a good insight <clears throat> into a lot of the problems that uh, a lot of people have, and especially with regard to wind players, because a lot of people wound up coming to me because I happen to have a certain amount of knowledge in both areas. And I've always, I'll confess to you, <laughs> I always felt like a clarinet player who happened, to, who happened to be a dentist. That's really been my personal identity because yeah. uh, through all of that, I always, I always continue to play clarinet to practice as much as I could. Of course, I was a father and a husband and you know, all the stuff that went with that and still does. And, um, but you know, the love of the, of the instrument, I think, brought me to a junction where there are things that I know about the mouth that have been very significant, I think, and, and, and giving me the ability to help some people. And in some instances, made the difference between their being able to play and not play. So for me, the combination was... I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything better. There's probably many dentists and periodontists that play the clarinet, but not like you play the clarinet and not with the experience that you've had and the people that you've known and the things that you've learned and the ability to connect all this information. And now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I've been thinking a lot in preparation for this conversation. I should have, I should have forewarned you about any of this. This is all. No, go ahead. Yeah. Give me, yeah. give me, give me, <laughs> give me a curveball. So I've been thinking a lot about how i don't even have a read on this i'm going to put a read on it just so it feels normal to me i've been thinking a lot about how the clarinet goes into my mouth can i ask you a clarinet player's question sure what kind of mouthpiece is that <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah no I, sh I should disclose that this is a, a b as a van doren bd4 yeah which, I, figured. I would love to see your mouthpiece collection because i've got too many mouthpieces i you know i've i've, I've played on and loved many different mouthpieces and as I, I feel like every mouthpiece i have it's it's like it's it's a it's never a marriage it's just a sort of it's we get to know each other quite well for a couple of years and then i move on because uh, because to me that's actually part of being a better getting to be a better clarinet player and learning is not necessarily getting stuck on the same thing i mean i think there's probably a for every clarinet player there's a different version of if that's true for them or not but for me like in order for me to continue to hear something different in my sound i needed to feed me feedback something different than i was getting before and then that gives me something interesting to to think about to to change and and, and respond with i like changing mouthpieces quite quite regularly but but, but so i've been thinking about how the, the instrument goes in my hand and that i've been working on this i practice this. this is kind of a very boring thing to practice but I practice just holding the clarinet with my thumb 
and I try and think about the weight of the bell going this direction. So the mouthpiece rests by itself with, the ener with that much energy against my top teeth. So I can just hold it like this, and then I put my mouth on it with, without biting down. And that's something that I want you to talk about because you know way more about this than anybody I know in terms of biting down, what that means. So I'm resting the clarinet and it's against my teeth. It's kind of, it's not pushing, I'm not pushing it forward. The weight of the clarinet is pushing it forward. And then I put my mouth on the instrument, only the, the degree to which it takes pressure to make the reed vibrate. As a launching point. Tell me I'm wrong, tell me I'm right, tell me what parts of that you agree with, disagree with, and, and sort of wrap around what you think about that I, this thing about how to, how do we have the clarinet in our mouth, and, and what angle, and why, and what it does from a clarinet standpoint, and from an oral cavity standpoint, and all the things that you know about that the rest of us don't. Well, that's not a curveball. Actually, you know, there's no answer to your question. You're, 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 you're telling me what you feel. Right. When you clarinet in your mouth, right? No. That's neither wrong nor right. I mean, that's what you feel. And I'm not playing games with you. I, I, that's, that's, that's right. You're, you're right. The, the bell does uh, the bottom part of the clarinet. It's like a fulcrum. Your, your yeah. thumb is the rotating center of the fulcrum, and the clarinet has the tendency to, to do this. You know, it's just it's this kind of, of motion. Um, you get around that, by the way, by wearing a strap. And I think a strap is a very, very important part of playing the clarinet. First of all, because you can remove some of the weight bearing interference on your thumb, your right thumb, because it has to hold the weight of the clarinet. Uh, <clears throat> that certainly is going to, uh, you know, I, it's a subject that I'm very, very aware of um, in terms of angulation. Now, the, ang the angle, the right angle, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 10 degrees, I mean, Look at my, my face. My chin is out further than my nose is. So I can't, you know, I, I can't hold the clarinet down. Bonad holds the clarinet like this. It's right down on his, it's on his belly. Right. You look at pictures of Joe Allard. He's playing like this. Move it out further, Joe is. But Bob Marcellus has got a receding chin somewhat. And he's playing so that it's almost like that with the medialis, the corners of your mouth, because the medialis, they angle down. And on most clarinet players, legitimate, class legitimate, his symphonic clarinet players, they're not, they're not playing with, with the tra traditional smile with the upturned corners of the lips, it's a lot, which is what a lot of people teach. Right, and then the zygomaticus, which is the, the the muscle that goes from the zygoma, which is the arch, the cheekbone arch, to the corners of your mouth, the orbicularisaurus, which is like a rubber band, top and bottom. Now there there are a lot there's a lot of tremendous amount of misinformation in terms of what teachers give, and the only reason why I know that with a few students that I've had and friends who I've gotten into talking to with, if they have a particular teacher, what the teacher said is the guru. And therefore, you don't dare contradict them. But if you look at, I have pictures on my wall here of Jimmy Abato. James Mr. Abato is playing right here. Um, Bonard has got this form. You look at at, at McLean who's playing like this. But these are this is double lip guy, single lip guy, uh, somebody playing the saxophone with the saxophone down here, and somebody playing it here. Steve Williamson is playing the clarinet with his head down, almost like almost like a saxophone. It gets a gorgeous sound. Yeah. So to, to answer your question, there's no wrong or right here. I mean, your mouth, if you have an overbite and your chin is not too prominent, you can probably do exactly what you were just showing. And that makes a big difference. And by the way, you'll find that if you wear a strap and hook it, and here you can play. I don't. I never have my my thumb against the the thumb rest. My thumb is always down here. As a matter of fact, I've taped on. I've taped on a little pad. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right? Electrical tape. This this clarinet is my new Yamaha, which I love. 
but I've, I've already uh, customized the, 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 the keys by grinding some of them, by smoothing some of them down, and by adding things like this little pad here, so that when I play, there's a hook that holds the right. the, the strap. So I have my thing, finger, my thumb is, it doesn't support any of the weight. The, 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 the strap does, and it rests against the biting edges of my upper teeth. Right. It rests there. Right. Now, Ricardo teaches his students push down with the, in other words, use your head to push slightly down, down toward the bottom of the clarinet, which does certain things on the interior of your mouth. When you curl your upper lip and pull back as if you're playing double embouchure, but not playing double lip, it automatically reflexively raises the soft palate in the back of your mouth. That opens up the area in back of your mouth, which is called the oropharynx, the oropharynx which is a combination of the throat pharynx and the oral cavity. And that opens up a, a much bigger volume of air than you would have if you didn't do that. So when you play and grip the mouthpiece with your lips, I think the person who came closest to describing it properly was Henry Sommer who said, you just hold the mouthpiece with your lips around as if there was an elastic band going around. Now, there are people who say you shouldn't push up against the reed because if you do that, you're going to dampen the, the vibration of the reed, which is nonsense. You can't push up without pushing down. Okay. So when you have, when, when you have a, 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 a U shape, you know, uh, how can I do that? It's it's it looks hmm, like a curve this way and a curve this way, right. so that they interlace in the corners of your mouth. So there's a perfect combination for closing your lips around the reed and the mouthpiece, and exerting pressures on the top, on the bottom, and on the sides. You're not you're not clamping down the sides unless you're biting with your teeth, which you shouldn't do. And the support should come mainly from the soft tissues around the mouthpiece and the reed. Now that means starting with that, and there's a lot more that goes on about the air dynamics inside your mouth. The finding the right angle is just a question of doing this, playing and finding out where the sound goes. Right. So, so, tremendous differences in what the quality of the sound is. And in order to get the point of, of proper resonance, um, I'm gonna sound weird to you right now, but you won't believe it, but I'm convinced it's true. The right way to find out where your sound is by using a vibrato. Oh, okay. No, that, 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 I've never heard it. What I love the most is when somebody you, says something yeah, I've never heard right. before. I've never heard anybody say this. Talk about it some more, because I, I, want, I want to understand. Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my favorite things that I say are things that other people don't say. And so, like, when somebody says something that, like, after, you know, 40 years of playing this instrument and with studying with great players and hearing all sorts of amazing clarinet players talk about the clarinet, when somebody says something I never heard before, consider me interested. <laughs> well, I never said it publicly before because I'm afraid of being laced and, and tarred and feathered and kicked out of town, especially with my background with Bob Marcel. <laughs> who's the most anti-vibrato person you've ever met in your life. To, to talk, talk to me about how to find our, our sound through the use of vibrato. That's getting way ahead of, of what I wanted to say. Okay, well, then, to... then all in good time. You're in charge. Yeah. Uh, no, I have no reluctance to doing it, except that you have to understand that it's, it's, I'm saying this in conjunction with the way I play. And the way right. I play is, is a little bit different from the way people have been taught to play. First of all, I think the uh, the concept of blowing into the clarinet is totally wrong, and 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 I think that that ties in with what I'm about to say about the vibrato, right? Because I think the right way to get a vibrato and to keep the resonance in the sound is to make it a combination of a breath vibrato and a pitch vibrato. They're both very different, right? Uh -huh. So that if you play with a breath vibrato, it's like well. Uh, somebody once said, just as, as if you're saying ha ha, well, that, that's okay, but you have to do the ha 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 without any sound, no vocal 
a vibration in your throat because if the larynx is involved, you're cutting off the air. You don't want to do that. Right. But if you were to go very, very soft and then use the, 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 the lip contractions to coincide. Now listen carefully. I'm trying. When you blow a little bit more into the clarinet or you exhale a little more forcefully, which is the nomenclature I prefer. Right. What happens as you get louder on the clarinet as opposed to the flute, it gets flatter, right? Yes. yes. So if you have to add a pitch vibrato to that, guess where you do it? You do it at the crescendo. Okay. Like, and you have to start off, however, with your tongue, the tip of your tongue, right near the reed. Now, I've heard several teachers tell me, when you want to get a really good sound, legato, make sure your tongue is near the reed. Well, you know, that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. And I was a dentist who's treated some very fine clarinetists and asked them to do things with their tongue to get them out of the way for me to get to someplace. Right. right. Like the instruction is take the tip of your tongue and put it up toward the left palate. And that happens. They, they don't know what to, where to do it. Right. And I have to take the tongue and place it where you want to and say, keep it there. Now, these are people who are playing all the time. Right. And they're maybe staccatos, they're playing legatos, they're playing, you know, they're playing open sounds. Um, so I think the control of the tongue has to be taught. And I think you have to teach it in a certain way so that when you're playing, you can play, you can teach, train somebody to play a, an open G and pull. <laughs> That sounds strange, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the vibration of the tip of the reed with the tip of my tongue and then pulling it away. And just yeah. as a minute you get it away so that it gets a, a sound with no muffles down to it, that's where the tongue should be. That's where it should stay. Now, right. if you want to then, on top of that, get a, 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 a sound vibrato, a volume vibrato, That's the f f f right? right. And then a pitch vibrato will be. You hear that? Yeah. Put it together. What's happening there is there's a kernel of resonance that is optimum at that particular junction where where all of a sudden the vibrato causes a sound. and then you don't have to play with a vibrato you can just go to as opposed to or right, exaggerating okay. right. right in between there's a spot where you the the sound in the the, the chamber of your mouth which is really a sound chamber feels right. you can actually feel the vibration of the sound and also feel the passage of the air over the tip of your tongue. Where have you heard that before? Nowhere, really. Of course not. But, the, but the, I mean, yeah, this, it's a very touchy kind of thing. As somebody watching this might think that it's, uh, I think I've taken this to a place where you... <laughs> no, this is, no, this is, this is super interesting. Because one of the things that like, I feel about when a, when a teacher, including me, makes any sort of gesticulation about articulation, even if I say, pull your tongue off the reed, like that's a huge motion compared to what our tongue is actually doing. Our tongue should actually be not moving, kind of. Right, exactly. And, As a and, matter of fact, teach, teach students how to play. That, that way you can get the tongue right to where you want it. What is, what is that phenomenon? If like we have a hair in our mouth, it feels huge, but it's not. Like, and so I wonder, is, is there a way that we experience the motion of our tongue to be greater than it is because of our inability to perceive spatial relationships in our mouth? Am I making any sense in this question? Yes, of course. It's called proprioception. Okay. Proprioception is knowing where, you're, where parts of your body are without uh, necessarily looking at them or seeing them. Because the tongue, by far, is the best friend you've got. It's where you put the tongue and what you do with it. I'm going to give you a theory that I have that I don't oftentimes say out loud, and I've maybe never said it out loud, except to very close friends. I think, I, I consider my tongue 
in two parts, the consonant part of my tongue and the vowel part of my tongue. And they're largely unrelated, except for I need to be sure when I'm articulating with the consonant part of my tongue, the very, the very tip of it, that the vowel part of my tongue, the voicing part of my tongue, is not moving in conjunction with it. Does it, does, does it sound like it's accurate information? Well, it depends. I mean, if your tongue is going up and down or if it's going back and forward. Right. If it's going back and forward, the entire tongue has eight, it has eight muscles. Right. It has four intrinsic, four extrinsic. The four intrinsic makes the shape of the, of the, of the, of the tongue. Make right. it curl, make it flat, make it arched. Make it, and then the, the other four are to move it up and down and sideways. So right. it's a very complicated, a very large muscle. And if you let it get in the way of articulation, which you can do, then it, it's very deleterious. But if you keep the back of the tongue down, down and back, mm -hmm. and only get up to the E, which everybody talks about. Everybody does talk about that, yeah. You're, 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 you're interfering with, you see, you can't do that. You, you, you shouldn't do that. The reason why is because the palate, the hard palate, in some instances, is highly arched. In some instances, it's flat. If you try to make an E with, a, with, with your tongue and then you have a flat palate, the back of your tongue here is mm -hmm. going to practically destroy the column of air. Now, what that does, as the air is coming up, your oropharynx say, this is the back of the tongue, this is the tongue, and this is your, your, your hard palate. If, if the back of the tongue is squeezed up against the, 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 the fastest point, the most, the, the, most, the, the most velocity you can get is right after that opening, back up in here, which is not where you want the velocity there to be. You want it to be in front, right in back of the front teeth. That's where you want the sudden velocity of air that goes through and forces the, the reed to vibrate using the Bernoulli, Prince, Bernoulli principle, making the reed vibrate up against the, the, the lay of the mouthpiece right. by passing air, velocity of air over the flat end of the reed and lifting the reed up until it hits the rails and comes down again. So the smallest aperture possible should be right near the, the tip of the, of the reed. Anything that chokes that off gives you the choke sound that you hear on the clarinet. Is there uh, a way to make any sort of broad generalization about where our tongue is rather than saying high or low? Like, so what I'm getting from this is the tip of my tongue should be very close to the top of my mouth, essentially. Because if I'm going to get the tip of my tongue close to the reed, it's going to be relatively close to my, it's going to be in between my teeth. It's no. not true. No, it's not true? Okay. No, because your tongue's going to lie flat and you can lift the tip of your tongue right up to the, to the, to the back of the reed. You're, you're just used to pushing it forward. Okay. Like, like e, e, is this rolling the E sound? Don't. Okay. Right now, take your upper lip and pull it back over your upper front teeth. Okay. Uh, now, talk, now talk to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's hard. It's hard to, it's, it's to do that without also doing that with my bottom. Don't, lip. don't do anything with the bottom lip. Okay. Just pull the upper teeth back over the front teeth, as okay. if you're playing double lip. Pull okay. back. Okay. What does it do to the back of your throat? Uh, it's moving it up a little bit. Yeah. It makes you want to yawn. Yeah, right. It does to me all the time. That, that is, Giuliani came closest when he tried to teach people by saying you should feel as if you're stifling a yawn. That's what that feels like. Right. You hear the sound of my voice? Yeah. That's what happens. It happens because I open up the sound chamber in my mouth. It's not here anymore. It's back here. That's what the sound. And that's what happens with your sound of the clarinet. Okay. Because the sound chamber is open. Then you can modify it from that point on. But if you start with the E sound, thinking you have to arch your tongue to get near the reed, that's like forcing. That's one of the things you do when you blow. You don't want to do that. You want to. You don't need any more pressure than that. If you really fill up the balloon by deep, by deep, deep breathing, by breathing down into your abdomen and below your abdomen, down to your pubic practically, where you're pushing everything in your abdomen all the way down. And then just let the elasticity, elasticity of your, your chest and your interproximal uh, inter uh, rib muscles pull down 
actually that will give you enough projection and enough velocity if your tongue's in the right place you don't have to blow any harder you can just get a sound by exhaling rather than pushing and if you modify the quality of the sound by modifying the shape of the oropharynx you give a sound chamber that makes a big difference in the sound that is coming through the clarinet because remember the clarinet and saxophone and oboe the vibration and the sound starts in your right. mouth so it's the anatomy of your mouth that is very determining. It's very interesting to have a conversation about this that has science behind it. Uh, Let me show you something. Yeah. The muscles of the mouth. Right there. Oh, well, yeah, okay. And their names. What they do by just making believe that the medialis, which is right right in the corner, and the, 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 the uh, zygomaticus here, the resorius down here, the, the, the buccinator here, the orbicularis oris here, around here. Once you understand the angle of all those muscles, by the way, I firmly believe that every wind instrument player should be an expert anatomist as far as the mouth is concerned. I really think so. I mean, I, I you know, I, I offered at one point, it wasn't picked up. But I decided I don't want to spend my time doing that, actually. But a place like, like, no, really, Juilliard. I mean, they should have somebody, not that I want to do it. I really don't. But they should have somebody come in and give a course on the nomenclature and the anatomy of the mouth. I mean, you should be able to talk to somebody, say the zygomatica should not be, in your case, is not the way to hold the, the, the reed. The resorius is, the buccinator muscle is, the orbicularis aurus is. The angle in your mouth, the the medialis should be angled down, not up. I mean, you know, there, because there, there are so many variables involved that you the more you know, the better off you will be able to do to find your own way because everybody's got to find his own way ultimately. Uh, is that the truth? It's very eye opening to me to like reflect upon all the things that not only have been told to me, but what I said to other people. It's sometimes difficult to come face to face with my own shortcomings as a teacher. And talking about this stuff, and and I and I feel like anybody that's watching this might have that same sort of feeling of like, well, it's uncomfortable to like actually like what you're saying. I think is undeniable. I think it's it's absolutely true. It's just difficult to realize that it's not been a part of my life on a regular basis. That that can be that that, that that's a complicated thing to deal with. But that which but but that's is exactly why I wanted to have this conversation with you. The way to get through that is use the internet. Yeah. Anybody can be an anatomist today. You just, the internet is incredible. I got that picture from the internet. Right. I mean, I didn't go to one of my texts, which which has illustrations that are not that good, not that simple. And it's just, it's a simple thing. It's a question if a muscle's angled this way, if it contracts, it does what a muscle does. It pulls up, you know, pulls up toward the bone, the angle of, of, of the, the, that tissue. So you know that if somebody's playing like this, which a lot of players do, with a smile, they're in their mouths, if they're getting a good sound, it works. Right. In, in that mouth, and you tell them to put the angle of the medialis down, it may not work. He doesn't have my chin. He doesn't have the size of my tongue. He doesn't have the the, the angle of my jaw. He doesn't know what my, larynx, my, my oropharynx is like. He doesn't know how big my tongue is. And these are all variables. And what, the, and very importantly, what the vault of the palate is. Right. How high is the palate? And I've looked in a lot of people's mouths. Some <laughs> some vaults are very, very, very high. Right. Some vaults are flat, almost like a roof. Right. right. And the, the, the clarinetist has to adjust to that. If he starts pushing up against that by making an E from a teacher who's got a high vault palate, because it works for him, and says, make the E sound, no matter. Shh. I've had several clarinetists and teachers say, Shh, sound like a hissing cat. Well, no, not in my mouth. It's right. more better, better to sound like a lisping person who speaks this way with, with the tongue right near the tongue, right near the teeth, s, s, as opposed to sh, sh. Those are different. Those are going to make different sounds in the clarinet. So, you, you know, everybody has to be equipped, I think, to be an oral anatomist. 